Hello and welcome to Ditching Hourly. I'm Jonathan Stark. Today I'm joined by the inimitable Wes Boss to talk about <laughs> how he created his training empire. <laughs> welcome to the show, Wes. Yeah, hey, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to chat with you. Yeah, I can't believe we haven't spoken before on the podcast. I, I actually no, had to do a... I, I could have swear I've been on it already, but I guess not. Yeah, me too. I went back and searched and nothing came up, but we, we've spoken at conferences. I Probably that might be what we're remembering. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so for the two people who maybe haven't heard your name before, what's the uh, quick and dirty background? Yeah, so my name is Wes Boss. I'm a full stack web developer from Canada. Um, I create online training courses, primarily centered around JavaScript, Node, React, CSS, things like that. Um, and I sell them. I also have a bunch of free courses as well that I uh, put out for the community to watch and, and learn from. And that's been my whole thing for, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years now. Hmm. And what was the what were you doing before you launched the first course? I was a freelance um, dev at... Um, at myself <laughs> and uh, just been doing, yeah, just doing freelance for, for a while. I did blogging at the same time, YouTube videos. Um, I taught um, in person, part time and full time at a boot camp uh, for a couple of years here and there. And uh, that's so that was kind of it. It was like freelancing, but also teaching. And then eventually everything came to just doing, making my own, own online courses. What was the first one? I, I feel like it was the JavaScript in 30 days free course. It was uh, my first product ever was Sublime Text, um, oh, yeah. Sublime Text Power User. And that was a paid, it was a book, actually. It was a book, and then it came with videos, and I decided I liked the videos much better. Um, and then I put out a free course called Command Line Power User that was kind of similar in the similar vein of Sublime Text. It's like, this is a tool that you're probably underutilizing. Here's how to be awesome at it. Um, and then... I had a React course and a Flexbox course. And so the JavaScript 30 one was probably in the middle of, of where I'm at. But that's that's the one everyone knows because that's by far the most popular course I've ever made. It's a, it's a free one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's funny because I, I remember uh, I bought the React course because I was working on a React course of my own. And I wanted to, you know, like check out what else was out there, make sure I wasn't saying anything stupid because <laughs> it was like, you know, <laughs> what, am I missing anything huge? Because React was pretty relatively new back then. I mean, it, yeah. it's it's leaps and bounds ahead of the curve now. Uh, and I just absolutely love the course, the delivery. It was super educational and entertaining. Uh, I mean, would have sworn in the marketing for that, you were kind of like, hey, I'm West Boss. You might know me from my free course, JavaScript 30, but I, I must have that backwards. Yeah, probably some other, um, or or maybe the I've updated the copy on my about, because I've, I've since re-recorded it a couple of times. So. Uh -huh. Uh, a lot of times I'll reference, hey, you might know me or emails like you probably get my emails. Like yeah. that's yeah. usually how I say like because I don't email very often. And when I do, people, you have to remind people like, hey, I'm the guy <laughs> from the JavaScript 30 course you signed up for. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Cool. OK, so was there was there a particular I mean, was it just that you put the videos together for the book and you're like, boy, the videos were a lot, a lot more fun than the book. And you decided to um, just do that full time or were you was there how long was the period I guess when you're still doing client work as a freelancer and like recording courses yeah um probably three years while I was doing both of them mm -hmm. um and then I slowly did less and less client work and more and more courses um and then after I launched my es6.io course mm -hmm. I remember being like okay that made enough money where I've feel like I could probably do this full time. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I sunsetted my last clients, which which I was sad about because I also really enjoy doing client work. It wasn't it wasn't this thing I was trying to get away from because mm -hmm. I love like going into a client and building new things and having new challenges every single time. But um, I really, really like doing the the video course as well. Mm, interesting. And I, I wonder, so I, a lot of people watching this or sorry, we're watching each, each other, but the, uh, listening to this, yeah. a lot of people, a lot of people listening to this, um, are software developers, tons. And they, uh, I know some of them are like, eh, I don't really want to teach. I like saving the day and, you know, swooping in and being a genius for a client. Uh, but a, a significant subset are like, I really want to have some kind of a product business. 
I'm really good at this thing that I do, whether it's, you know, whatever, React, Rails, Node, whatever. They've got some yeah. like, niche thing. Maybe they've got a book. Maybe they've been published like by O'Reilly or someone. Mm-hmm. And they they really want to get into like a product income. And, and oh, by the way, it, when everyone says it to me, they say, we want to be like Wes. We want to do what Wes <laughs> does because it looks like from the outside, it looks like so much fun. And when you're doing the videos, it's very, it just feels, the whole thing feels fun. Yeah. Do you have, like, where where would someone get started if they had, um, you know, garden variety developer, they understand how to make videos. Like, that's not the, you know, what should they worry about? How would you get started if you were going to do it all over again? Yeah, it's, it all comes down to, like, having an audience and people knowing that you're enthusiastic about teaching a specific topic or in my case, it's just web development in general. So, um, like, where do you start? Like, people always email me all the time or say, hey, I want to do it as well. Like, what should I should I do? Should I do this course on this specific thing? And um, at the end of the day, we don't know. And you you really need to start with uh, blog posts or YouTube videos, conference talks, a podcast, whatever your thing is. I would probably say right now it's YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. Um and just start putting content out there and like you're gonna have to put out unfortunately years of of content um before you hit on whatever that that thing is Mm -hmm. um like both you get comfortable in teaching you find your style because like that's another thing is like like when you first start you're like i don't know how to how to teach someone like should do i need a powerpoint or do i need to kind of riff off of it and um you need to find your people find your style um find your topics all of those things and and those things can really only um only come about when you are throwing stuff at the wall and Mm -hmm. seeing what sticks yeah publishing so i i think it's um you know i talk about writing a lot more so than courses you know writing books and and yeah daily writing and to me, it's it's not. It's great if somebody has like a daily writing practice, and they they want to. They think like, oh, I want to. I really like the daily lists that I'm on, and I think I've got a lot to say, and I think I could maintain a daily list. And, and they practice writing daily, but not publishing, and I, I just to kind of like see if it's going to work, or and they and then they run yeah. out on it. I think it's critical to release it into the world, like that piece, and getting the feedback from that. Yeah, is a necessary component of fun, you know, call finding it. It's I hate the term finding your product market fit, but it's like figuring out what resonates with the people who you can reach. And if you don't, if you skip that step, I mean, I I love that you didn't start with like, oh, I need a, I need a ring light and you need to have this microphone, you know, yeah, you need to to sort of do Google keyword searches to see what what people are Googling for and like this kind of opportunistic get rich quick approach to it, which wouldn't work anyway, probably. And you're like, well, you know, first you have to find a bunch of people, then you have to get good at teaching. (laughs) You have to like (laughs) have a style. Um, So I'm sure that's disappointing to, I I can imagine people being like, oh, that sounds like too much work. And it's like, well, okay, maybe that's not for you. But I mean, having a business isn't, you know, if you want easy, go get a job, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, you. It's. It, I hate when people say that kind of stuff. Like, oh, you have to love it and and things like that. Because, like, I do enjoy the making money from it and it being my business as well. And that's what people see at the end of the day. They're like, oh, I wish I could do that for my full time full time job. But um, the unfortunate downside is that you sort of have to get into it by not necessarily like you have to love what you do because that that also like rubs me the wrong way where like. Some people want to get into web development because it seems like a good, stable job. And it's not just because they have this dis- un- unending passion for creating input boxes where people type into, right? Like, <laughs> right. like not, not all of us have that un- unending thing. But, like, you do have to have at least a little bit of, like, I want to help people uh, be able to learn to create websites and to further their career and and stuff like that. I think that has to be at least a seed in in what you do to have that motivation to keep going. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, I agree with that. There's a lot of dips that you're going to go through, you know, like a, like a, a terrible launch or you pour your work, your heart into something and it, it launches to crickets, uh, you know, something like that. And you just like, if you're motivated, 
that kind of like purpose or vision or mission or, or whatever animating, whatever value system is animating your actions. Mm -hmm. Cause I agree with you. It's like, you know, just passion alone isn't, that doesn't work on its own. You know, there needs to be, I feel like, I feel like the thing that you were kind of, you didn't actually say it, but it's kind of in, in everything you've said so far, it's like, you have to care about helping somebody and or it certainly yeah. going to help a lot if you care about helping someone, which is like pretty core feature of being a teacher. It's not like, it's not enough to just be smart. Like, Oh, I know all this stuff. And then I'm going to yeah. capture all that. Yeah. You have to, you have to be good at what you do. Cause there's certainly a lot of other developers who are way better devs than I am, but I'm also excited about it. And also I like to learn how to feel like, I think I have like a, a bunch of different, like what's that book where you have to be like, the artist where you like make the pie, but you also have to be the administrator. What's the name of that book? Yeah. E-Myth. The E-Myth. Yeah. That, that, I think that's like the perfect book. If somebody's trying to understand, like, am, am I cut out for this just because you're a good developer or just because you're a good cupcake maker doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean you should open up a cupcake shop, right? Exactly. It's not the same thing, right? There's just as much of a craft to making cupcakes as there is to running a cupcake business. Yeah. So, well, that's a, that's an interesting angle. Like, do you consider yourself a good marketer? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Like, that's something I often say is that it kind of sucks that you have to be a good marketer. Like, it's good for me because I can run my business, but it kind of sucks that there's people out there who are super good devs, but they can't get their thing to get to to make money or to get going. Um, and it's unfortunately because they're missing design and marketing and spunk and all these other things that are not web development right. they're they're unrelated to being a web developer but they are related to getting somebody excited about your course and, and taking it and if someone's going to spend 20 hours learning to code with me um they better like me you know <laughs> right yeah i mean it, it it's there's a craft to a business you know, and there's a reason why pretty much any big company you look at has a CMO or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, Peter, I think it was Peter Drucker who said that, you know, the two, the only two value centers in a business are marketing and innovation. Like that's it, like R and D and marketing and everything else is a cost. Yeah. You know, so if you're going to start a business, but you don't want to you know, people are people are allergic to the words, especially developers are allergic to the word marketer, or marketing yeah. or ads or advertising. It's like, oh, use car salesman. But all it really is, is what you said at the beginning, which is, I think, a lot less threatening, where it's like, who do you want to help? And what do you want to help them with? Who you're excited to help? You know, there are people out there who you can help them get what they want, which is maybe, well, you you tell me what kind of people take your courses? Are these internal folks a lot of times or are they solo or freelance or contract? Um, it's it's a pretty good mix of like it also depends on like what type of course it is, but it's mm -hmm. a pretty good mix of um, existing devs who just need to skill up on a specific topic. So they'll want to learn Gatsby or React or whatever. And they're they're ready like maybe they're ready good devs. So they just blow through the course really quickly. Okay got it and they move mm -hmm. on and they take the course and now they've got that skill and they can go and and build their stuff and and another like big portion is like people who are um learning to be a developer they've been at it for uh one or two years and they're still like getting their chops in terms of how things work and they want to learn more and every course that they take they learn a whole bunch of stuff both about that tech as well as like surrounding tooling and thought process and debugging and, and things like that um so that's yeah it's it's kind of all over the place i wish and i also don't really like, have super good metrics on mm -hmm. that either like i don't run research groups or anything like that but that's just from the type of like team licenses that i sell as well as like the type of people that i'm talking to in the chat to see where they're at right yeah sort of anecdotal yeah what it's so there are a lot I've, I've had students that have you know uh done pretty well reasonably well uh with cor financially with courses on like i don't know you name it udemy or what you know front end masters or yep. some of these kind of like netflix for for developers types platforms did you ever experiment with any of those was there a uh, intentional reason that you created your own platform your own sites yeah um initially 
I initially like built my own platform because I was releasing a book and videos and there was like I couldn't put it on like Amazon books and you can't like just put the videos somewhere. So initially it was just a technical hurdle, hmm. but also like I'm very much about owning your content and owning your audience. Like I knew before I even launched my first course, I would look at folks like Jeffrey Way or Chris Coyer and hmm. they have this audience and it's their audience and they can go do whatever they want because uh, they own the audience and they're able to do it. And if you, if I were to like launch this thing on another course platform, yeah. um, then, then you're just putting me at the same level as 40 other courses on the same topic. Um, and then I don't own the audience at the end of the day. And if I want to, if I want to release something after that, then you're, you're kind of leaning on like most all people have is just like a Twitter followers. Uh, and you got to just milk that for, for all it's worth. Whereas, if you own the platform and I guess like the, the other, the downside to that is that like some people like Egghead is a really good example. Um, some people just want to record their courses and have somebody else take care of the rest of it. Yep. Email marketing, design, editing, all of these parts that are not necessarily all that interesting or annoying to, to people. Then they just, they just give them the videos and somebody else takes care of that. And that's a, that's a great option because all you have to do is you have to be good at teaching mm -hmm. and you got to have, they'll, they'll send you a microphone and all that stuff. <laughs> really? And uh, yeah, they, they literally will ship you a box of, of stuff like that. And you just have to be good at teaching and know what you're talking about. And uh, you can make like I'm uh, what I'm told pretty good money that way. Yeah. I mean, I, I know people that, that are doing, you know, they're not replacing their dev income or anything like that, but you know, mortgage money, uh, yeah. on a regular basis. And you have to, in tech, and this was one of the reasons why I stopped writing books about, about software was that, you know, it's like this, the, the, the time bomb is ticking. Like it's going to get out of date pretty quickly in most cases. So, yeah. That's, that's kind of why I'm not with books either. Like first it, it doesn't pay super well. And also, yeah, it becomes out of date so, so quickly, which by the time it gets on the shelf, the whole thing is out of date. I feel sorry for like I've seen a couple of React books go to publish, and by the time they're they're on the shelf, it's like, oh wow, this is not relevant at all anymore. Yeah, I I, I learned my lesson. I uh, I swore I'd never publish another book that had a version number in the title. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, a good idea. So bad, so bad. Like, but it's the exact same thing. Book launches, software updates two days later because it takes forever for a traditionally published book to come out. And then yeah. two, two days later, the software company is like, oh, we revved to version 10. Sorry about that book. <laughs> and and through a traditional publisher, uh, you're, the there's a lot of good reasons to, to traditionally publish, but, you know, making money is not one of them. No, no. I've, I remember having calls when I was writing this book. The, the reason why I started writing the book is because I had a couple people contact me after I was writing these blog posts, which I soon learned if you if you fart about a topic, they'll ask you to write a book about it. Um, but uh, I, I, they're like, hey, do you want to write a book? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. And then I was like, so how much money do I actually make? And they're like, oh, well, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can do okay. But, you know, it, that's how I, my first book deal came to. Same thing, like uh, blog posts. And they were like, hey, we've been looking for someone to write about this. You want to do it? Oh, yeah. And I saw, I, I saw it for what it was. I was like, I'm not going to make any money off of this, but it's going to position me as the expert on this thing. It was a very weird, totally. very specific thing. Maybe only, a, you know, if 5,000 people in the world cared about it at the time, I would have been surprised. But that was plenty. I mean, it, to me, it was like a 200-page business card. Like, yeah, I wrote the book on this, and there's only 5,000 people that care, but I can only work with maybe 10 clients a year. So that was fine for me. Yeah, that's true. Like, if you... That's one thing I, I didn't get from mine is people are like, oh, where can I buy the book? I'm like, it's a PDF. Like it doesn't have that real, uh, that real value behind it that a, a dead tree book does. Yeah. There's not as much authority to it, but, um, the flip side is, and I, I'm also like you, I'm fanatical about having nobody in between me and the audience fanatical. Yeah. And cause I, you know, I want to try different things. I want to experiment. I want to get feedback. I want to know who has my book, you know, so, I mean, this isn't, we're not here to talk about books, but 
Um, it's the same same kind of thing with you creating the platform, which is how we started talking about this. So it's a lot, of, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of work up front, uh, and not just not just technically, but because you decided that you were going to market it, you were going to be the business person, and you know, in the in the, the email, you were going to be the entrepreneur and the manager and the technician. Those are the three personality types oh, of the yeah. business. And you're like, yeah, I'm I'm in. I'll be everything. And yeah, yeah. And if for folks who who know, like, no way, I'm not doing that. I, I'm, I'm just not interested. I know I'm not good at it. And, I, and the more important thing is, and I don't want to learn it. Then yeah. maybe maybe something like, um, what did you say, Egghead? Yeah, Egghead is front end masters. Those are kind of the two big, big ones in the space right now. Which mm-hmm. is it's funny because Egghead also launched this thing. They they asked me if they could call it. They call it West Boss as a service because. <laughs> um, like apparently the problem that they're i don't know necessarily now if this is a big problem but uh people were saying like well why would i record courses for you if i could just do what wes is doing and do it all myself uh and they're like well um good luck because w- you have to do marketing and uh support and all the infrastructure and the payments and all of that stuff on top of actually recording the course so um, they now like their biggest one is that Kent C. Dodds has a um, testing and he has a React course as well, and uh, they run all the infrastructure and marketing behind it, and then he just works on building amazing content, which is a pretty good arrangement. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, uh, what do you, what are the the marketing activities that you consciously undertake? So, like you just had a launch for the Gatsby course, yeah, and you know, what, what were the things like, what does that look like for you? Is that two weeks of craziness leading up to it? And, you know, like 80 hour weeks, or do you just like, you finish the site, you upload the stuff and you just like send out a blast to your list and on Twitter. Um, usually what happens is I'm, I'm talking about it, sharing stuff on Twitter, on Instagram, screenshots, uh, lists of videos, captions that come back. And that starts to, starts to make some sort of hype sorry if you can hear rumbling there's a no, I can't uh, excavator outside my house okay good yeah. um <laughs> <laughs> microphone gets that out good mic, yeah. uh, so basically just talking about everything on twitter um and then um i'll usually email once or twice um that i'm working on something i don't do it a whole lot because i don't like getting the when is this coming emails <laughs> i i do like those because that means people are literally excited about it but i also don't it's a lot of overhead to have to reply to those people so Um, There's that. Um, And then uh, I launched the thing. So put up the website. Um, I don't really have super long weeks or anything like that. Pretty standard. Just Mm -hmm. get it done within my regular 40 hour work week. Um, And then I'll usually go pretty hard on the email list, emailing out. Like I think with the Gatsby one, I emailed my entire list three or four times, which for some people is not hard. Some people that's a old navy t-shirts are on sale um but for me that's hard i don't email a whole lot uh and uh i'll go go hard on that go hard on twitter instagram things like that um and then just start working on the next one um Mm -hmm. obviously getting the chat and doing little updates and things like that but uh that's kind of what my my launch sequence looks like cool so uh starts on twitter like how far in advance on twitter do you just, like the whole time you're making it are you just like oh i'm working on a new gatsby course or do you you like limit that to the maybe last week or two no no definitely the whole time i'm working on it and, and that way like as i'm working on something i can ask questions about specific yeah. tech that i should be using um and that gives me a really good insight into what people are expecting and what problems people are having with the with the tech um because as you start talking about it people will say hey are you gonna cover this or what is your approach to this or i'll ask like what headless cms should i be using and you'll get a bunch of input on on something like that um very much work in the open put it i put all the code that i'm working on for the course up on github and i don't publicly i don't publicly show it to everybody but enough people that care um seek it out send me pull requests and things like that like people are (laughs) excited enough about the tech (laughs) that they'll do that which is kind of cool yeah i'm a huge advocate of this too working working in the open and don't be you know don't wait till it's perfect i mean you're doing the opposite you're inviting them in to the studio practically not quite but almost and I, I had an, a similar, an experience that really cemented this for me years ago in 2009. 
I was working on a book for O'Reilly and they had a new, it was relatively new at the time. Uh, it was like an early access plan and they program and they created, um, this was like before GitHub, Git was even a big thing. We were using uh, CVS and we were, you know, and when I would commit to the repo, cause we were writing the whole thing in, in, uh, in a, for, under version control, you would commit to the repo and it would create like a website of the book that had, um, it's kind of like medium is now it was a, a, a more basic version of what medium is where you could highlight a paragraph and ask questions about it. Like almost oh, like yeah. a Google doc. It was great. It was amazing because I'm, you know, I'd write chapter two or whatever and then submit it and boom, the site's up and O'Reilly would send out a notification to all the people who had subscribed for updates and they'd ask all these great questions that I missed, you know? And, yeah. And I just, boom, right back into the book. And that book was very successful as, as software books go. And I, yeah. I, I attribute it to that. It's not because I'm so smart. It's because we got reader feedback while I was writing it. Yeah. It, what it a, just was what great. a tr- uh, trick, you know, being mm-hmm. able to, to get that because you can, you can put it right back into the book. And it's like, like they always talk about like marketing like taking people's problems and turning them into the copy, but you're you're literally taking people's technical problems and turning them into the solutions of into the, the product. The technical. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, so I've got I've got sort of maybe a bunch of random questions about being a course creator full time. Sure, especially in the tech space. How often do you have a situation where you? need to go back and basically redo a whole course. And how do you think about, would you, in this situation where you feel like a course has, is getting too out of date, do you say, ah, maybe I'll just kill it? Or do you, like, how do you think about that? How much work is yeah. it to do it the second time? Um, it depends on the product, obviously. Some some of them, like uh, my grid and Flexbox courses, they won't go out of date because they are the spec. Right. Mm-hmm. And they the only thing that happens is that stuff is added to Flexbox or Grid and you just tack a video on the end and say, hey, now this is out, um, which is great. Um, other things like like React, GraphQL, Next.js, these things are um, constantly evolving and they're always becoming better and out of out of date. So um, at that point, you just kind of say like, OK, uh, um, you sort of have to look at the landscape of all of the dependencies and say, is something coming out like my advanced react one um i meant to re-record it probably about eight months ago but i had been waiting for a major version of apollo which is the data management library um to come out um because i couldn't just record it on the old version knowing that this new one was about to come out right. but i also needed to to output it already so it, it's been in this kind of limbo being like okay we're waiting and now it's all out and so now i'm i'm, I'm working on uh re-recording that so um, there's that, uh, there've, I've only ever like deprecated one course and that's my Redux course. Um, just because it's sort of falling out of favor with developers. Um, and I just didn't see any, any benefit both. Cause like I personally don't use it anymore and I didn't see any benefit, um, in re-recording the entire thing. Mm-hmm. So, um, I still, people still go through it just to get the, the ideas and stuff, even though the code is out of date. Um, they just watch it to get the kind of the headspace of how it works. Um, but I've, I've formally deprecated that one and the rest of my sort of just kind of keep on, on updating them and, and redoing them. Like my, my beginner react one is up for renewal and I think it's gonna be the fifth time that I've re-recorded it. Oof. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think that's the one, I think that's the one I took. Um, it was a, like a fish, a fish restaurant. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Catch of the day. It's like yeah, a real time, yeah. <laughs> real time app. Yeah. So uh, if I remember correctly, yeah, there's a, there's like a, a Slack room that you have that goes along with that. I think that was the premium. Uh, that, well, yeah, let's talk about pricing. So uh, you look around and prices are all over the board for stuff like this. You know, you've got these yeah. kind of subscription model, all you can eat places to go. And you've got the kind of like one-off style that you have. Um, what does, how do you think about pricing? What do you look at? How do you choose? Uh, and when you're making, t- why do you use tiers at all? And what have you found from using that? Yeah. Um, I initially started my Sublime Text one 
um, significantly lower. And uh, I, I realized that like people were telling me like, hey, this is too cheap. Um, I think I started it at like $40 for the whole package or something like that or or 90 or 60 dollars um and now i'm up to uh my main package is um 139 um and then pretty frequently i'll bring that down to 89 dollars on a whatever sale is, is going on at the moment so mm -hmm. um i've sort of teased that out by going up and down with the the price of my courses over time um and i've just landed on that being um both like what I feel comfortable charging um, mm -hmm. because like sometimes you see these guys with like $899 course and it's like, come on. Like, I know you just, I know you just like read some like yep. Neil Patel book or whatever. Yeah. Well, he, that's and, probably on my mailing list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like I was like, I know what, I know what course you just went through and that's doesn't feel okay to me. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. So, uh, I don't know. That's just, I guess this is where I've landed on and, and what people are, are willing to pay. And then I also, um, came up, I didn't come up with it, but I'm, I'm going to take credit as bringing it into the training industry, which is parity purchasing power. Um, basically like there's a lot of developers in India and Nigeria and Japan and all over the world where the income for a web developer is, a quarter or half of what they make in in North America. Mm -hmm. um, and so I built this whole thing where it like detects what country you are and then offers up a coupon code based on that and it has to restrict it by the country. And that's been huge to me because um, like I have a cost obviously to stream these videos and, and whatnot and it's expensive, but I am still able to, to offer it at uh, a reduced price. And people have been surprisingly uh, very receptive to that to a point now where dozens of other course creators do support this as well. Yeah, that's cool. It's, it's come up in the, you know, I sell a lot of info products. It's come up from time to time and, uh, it's, it's very, you know, for someone who doesn't code anymore, me, you know, me, I just code like little fun things on the side, but I'm not like developing anything big. I, I like just use off the shelf stuff and open source. And it's like, yeah, why would I bother? Uh, but that particular that particular thing seemed like a tough nut to crack, a really tough nut to crack. Uh, but anyway, yeah. so I'm, I'm glad to hear that you've done that, and it's inter I don't know if that's something that people do. You have like a repo or something that explains how you did that. I, or? So we have a if you go to Syntax I have a podcast talking about how I did it and how I come up with the rates and everything like that. And none of it's open source, purely because I don't want to be in the middle of some economist showdown. Um, <laughs> like I don't. Like I already get people emailing me and being like, "This we this is not big enough discount. That's not too much." Like, yeah. and the whole reason I did that is because people email me with these huge stories about their life, and I would I would care, but I didn't have the like bandwidth to right. be empathetic to every email that came in. So I just yep. immediately just said, "Here's here's my policy," um, and you have to sort of watch them because economies crash and go up and down and you have to adjust the rates every now and then. But, um, I just put it out there. There's, there's people parody bar.com. Someone's made like a SAS to do this now. Um, there's a couple other people who have released open source where they base it on how much a big Mac is or how much Spotify <laughs> is in your country. And there's people that have, have sort of, which is kind of what I was hoping is people have kind of taken it and done the work to make it public. And then mm. I'm not the guy that is in the middle of choosing how much someone should have to pay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Only yeah. for my own products. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. That's, it does feel like a giant, it, it always appeared like a huge can of worms to me and I've, I've skirted yeah. it so far, <laughs> uh, but I put out tons of free stuff too. So usually when people are having a hard time, I'm like, hey, look, just stay on the mailing list, read my blog. It's all there. It's all free. Yeah. That, you, that's you know, good. It's just, it's just, uh, the books are a more curated version of, of all the blog posts. Um, okay. So, oh, there was one, one other pricing question. Do you basically gravitate around the same prices for each course or do you have certain courses that are, that you consider to be more premium for some reason? Um, no, no, they're all the same price. Mm -hmm. Um, and they all like some of them, some of them will go on sale sometimes. Sometimes I'll bring them like black Friday. I'll bring them all down. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, they're, they're all the same. And that, that's the other thing I say is that my free courses are no different than the premium courses. Um, 
they're just free <laughs> and uh that that's that's it right at the end of the day there's no there's no real difference between the two it's not based on how long they are or how many videos you get because i just try to how long it is is irrelevant it just matters like you're trying to learn the skill i'm gonna teach you that skill in the shortest amount of time possible right yeah i agree and then with do you still do pricing tiers or is it all just one price and you know maybe like early bird discounts yeah. at launch um I have like every time I have my course, I've got my starter course and then I have the master package and the starter is just um, less videos, like like not all the videos, like maybe half the videos or wherever it makes sense to make a logical break where right. you're not left being like, what? This app is half broken. <laughs> um, and then the master package is everything. And and I've, I've been thinking about getting rid of the starter course just because almost everybody buys the master package. Um, but then sometimes you get people buy the starter and they'll upgrade later. And then there's this whole like price anchoring. I've never yeah. really gone into price anchoring before. So um, I don't have any, I don't have anything behind that. It's just kind of, it's been working for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have like team licenses, which you can buy 10 to a thousand spots at uh, a certain amount per person. It's usually about 40 bucks per person and they'll sell pretty well as well. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Do you do how how do those sales come about? Do you do anything to foster that, or you just make it? You just public, you know, like it's just there at the checkout, and people notice it. Yeah, and do it. it's it's just there. Um, I know a lot of people do like like B two B marketing and things like that, but generally it's just like a developer on the team says, "Hey, I'm going to buy this," um, and they say, "Oh, there's team licenses," and then say, like, "Oh, maybe well somebody else somebody else wants in," or they'll be like, "Yeah, we'll get a ten pack and." And then they put in the Slack, hey, anybody want this course? And then uh, what happens more often than not is they run out of spots and they have to come back for more because <laughs> they like put it out there. Everyone's like, yeah, I want in the course. Um, oh, so I do that. And then the, the only thing that I do special is, um, and this is not advertised anywhere, but um, people will be like, hey, we have like four devs. Like, what do we do there? Like, we don't need 10. We have four. And then I'll say, okay, we can, um, I'm not going to give them like a five pack. Um, like I don't have a five pack. So, uh, they say, okay, well, um, I can make it a, what's called a flex license where I have a little Boolean in the back end. I flip, um, and that will allow them to use those 10 or 500 spots for any of my courses instead uh -oh. of just that course that they bought it for. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, the, then, then they'll go ahead and say, oh, okay, yeah, okay. We'll take the 10 because it, it, the four devs will take two courses and then two other devs will take two, another one. And then we're at our 10 there. Yep. Smart. Cool. Okay. So, uh, have you ever done any, I don't know if you, I don't know if you even can talk about this, but I seem to remember that you had one course that was sponsored. Is that, am I remembering yeah. that? How did that, yeah, if I've, you can talk about that, how did that work? Um, I've had two courses that are sponsored, uh, learn Redux, um, and, uh, CSS grid. Mm -hmm. Um, and learn Redux was the first one, um, where, Sentry, which is a bug tracking service that you it's a little bit of JavaScript you put in your actually it's it's any um it's any language, but for me it was JavaScript. And then if there's errors that get thrown on your server or on your client's website on the client side, it will like log them and all the information for like when a um I feel like I'm doing an ad transition because they also <laughs> they also sponsor our podcast, but basically <laughs> it it tracks all of your error and exceptions. Uh -huh. And uh they said like hey like um can we do something together? And like, can we have a video in one of your courses or can you make content for our website or something? Um, just open to ideas of working together. And I said, oh yeah, well, um, I'm working on a Redux course. How about a, one of the videos is me um, showing how to integrate it into it. And then and then I can make this whole course free because they'll pay me for that. And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, sure, let's, let's do it. And uh, they, they took a bit of a risk on me because I was pretty, small at the time. Um, and that course did super well. I think they got their money back, uh, pretty easily from that. So there was that one. And then uh, a year or two later, um, Mozilla kind of did the same thing. They're like, Hey, like, can we do something together? We're open to ideas. Let us know. Um, and that's cool. Cause like I get emails all the time from companies that are like, Hey, would you like to take our .NET CMS and create a course for it? I'm like, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> but when like, like super cool companies that I already use, like I already had used, um, say, Hey, can we do something together? Um, I'll come back to them and say, Hey, like, this is my idea. I'm working on it in, in the terms of Mozilla. 
I said, hey, I'm working on a CSS grid course. Um, I was going to use Firefox anyway, but how about I use Firefox? <laughs> and uh, I just like the reason it's free is because Firefox paid for my time to create this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I get to put it out there for free. And that that works super well because it's me showing how to use Firefox. And then there's this huge goodwill of Firefox helping the community in general learn web development stuff for free. Right. Yeah, I, that's the one I remember. I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. Cool. So we're just about getting up to time. Um, I, I just had one last question. It's sort of like uh, really specific, but I'm curious about the the kind of arc of a new course, you know, so like it, I'm imagining it's sort of like big head, long tail um, or, but I am curious, like how older courses, you know, not out of date, but you know, not maybe two or three launches ago. Um, I'm imagining there's a lot of activity at the beginning of a launch, but then, you know, a mm -hmm. year or two later, if assuming the course is still current, like, do, is there a lot of cross pollination between like, Oh, you know, Gatsby, I just released the Gatsby course and then they take that and they love it. And then I don't know, like, does, is there crossover Do people still buy oh, old yeah. courses? Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of people will go through the back catalog or pick up a course when it's on sale and they'll, they'll learn it. Um, so there's, there's that, which people say, Oh man, I loved the free JavaScript 30. I want to learn other skills. What else do you have? So there, there's that. Um, so there's a pretty good long tail on these courses. Like the, the only downside being that you have to keep them up to date. Right. Um, and then uh, the other thing is that a lot of people are just like, I need to learn Node. What do I do? Like it happens all the time on Twitter. Take Wes's mm -hmm. Node course. And then people say, oh, yeah, OK, awesome. I'll, I'll take that. So it's yep. it's also just being there, being one of the best courses for a specific tech. Mm -hmm. uh, people will will seek out what what they are. Yeah, that's great. So that creates, you know, for folks listening, I mean, the show is ditching hourly, right? And like, talk about creating, it's like creating an annuity. Uh, it's like having money in the bank that's just throwing off dividends. Because I'm imagining that, you know, the number of people who take the courses and retakes, it is not, it cannot be a linear increase in the level of effort for you. It's like, it just sells and somebody takes it. And, you know, I'm sure you have you know, customer support stuff. And can we get an invoice for this? And yeah, you know, VAT with the VAT number on it and so on and so forth. But, you know, the, <laughs> that's always the one, the VAT know, number. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, this is a stupid question because I know what you're going to say, but the quality of life, uh, having your time disconnected from your income, I'm imagining that is extremely nice. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's really nice to be able to sit down and work on what I want to work on. Um, and some days I, I feel like that. I'm like, this is the best. Um, I can, I can just like, I can spend a day fiddling with this tech. And then other days are just like, oh my gosh, I need to update this thing. This needs to get, uh, this needs to get released. I have to record two podcasts and things like that. And some days it's just like, it's a lot to. So I feel like, oh, I got to keep up with everything, all that I've built. And um, part of that, that's just running a business. Like I now right. have a, a guy who does support in the chat for me, so I don't have to dip into that as often. And I have an assistant that does all the, can I get an amended invoice and things <laughs> like that. So that's helpful. But yeah, like you said, it's it's great to be able to, to just... Like, I don't feel like I have to trade. I always say ass and seat time. I think that that's your whole thing, right? Yeah, you don't exactly. have to trade your time for sitting in a seat for... Uh, the money that you're making and you have the freedom to um, just go down different avenues and, and try stuff out and, and have fun with stuff where you don't have to necessarily wor worry about it having a ROI. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, that's probably a great place to leave it. So thanks so much, Wes, for coming on the show, uh, sharing this with people. As a matter of fact, you're, you're episode number 200. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> wow. That's you've been in that for a long time then. Yeah. Yeah, two hundred yeah. episodes worth. <laughs> I love I love <laughs> podcasting. I, I would podcast all day if I if I could. So awesome. Where should people go to find out all about the West Boss Training Empire? Um, go to westboss.com. That's my personal site. Uh, there's a there's a link on there that lists all of my courses. Um, other than that, I'm mostly on Twitter and Instagram at westboss w e s b o s. Um, that's that's usually where I'm updating my more like frequent stuff. 
And, uh, and then I have a podcast as well. I forgot. Yeah. Uh, syntax.fm. That's our podcast related yep. to web development. Yep. Great show. Love it. It's a really good show. So podcast listeners, jump on over to syntax.fm if you're interested in hearing more Wes. Um, and, and that'll do it for episode 200. Woo! <laughs> All right, everybody. I am Jonathan Stark. Thanks for listening. This has been Ditching Hourly. See you next time. Hey, Jonathan again. The next time someone asks you for your hourly rate, I want you to stop what you're doing and go over to valuepricingbootcamp.com to sign up for my free value pricing email course. That URL again is valuepricingbootcamp.com. Hope to see you there.